Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. A- 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 Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Hello, weekday warriors and weekend funsters. It's time to get schooled again in another tech talking session with our favourite tech tutor, Mr. Matthew Dickerson. How are you, Matt? I'm excited, James. I get excited every week. It's just, I love talking about yeah. technology and someone that actually understands it and grasps it like you do. It's actually great because some people just gloss over when I start talking to them, whereas you actually get it. So it's fantastic. Well, yeah, it's nice to, to bounce backwards and forwards here. You've got a fair handful for us today, though. Uh, we're talking about robots designed specifically for grooming, renting out our driveways and petrol stations of the future. Um, but we're going to kick off today with a really nice one here. Um, it's a bit of therapy for people with um, major phobias. Now, I'm pretty scared of heights myself. I'm wondering how can technology help me finally enjoy a good Ferris wheel? Yeah, well, it could actually help you, although is there such a thing as a good Ferris wheel? I'm not sure if that exists, well, does it? yeah, I know they're supposed to be good, but I just get on them and I just talk all the way through. I babble, <laughs> and that's to get myself through it. <laughs> and well, the rest good. of my family just laugh at me. I'd like to hear so you babbling, <laughs> actually. I haven't heard you babble, so I'd like to hear that. But we, we've got virtual reality, and I love virtual reality headsets. I, I've played a number of games with a VR headset, and it's it's so immersive. It's just unbelievable. I've played on games that have got like a roller coaster and you, you feel like you're actually in it and on it. So that's great fun, but probably not It's useful. great fun to watch from a, a spectator's point yeah. of view as well as they fall over the coffee table or uh, right. <laughs> yeah, run into a wall. Or, yeah, 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 or I love when my kids get there and they're playing and you grab them just from the side while they're in some part of the game and it just scares the bejesus out of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they've got some sort of uh, you know, psychological advantage here, right? Absolutely. If you do have a phobia like heights or spiders or needles, whatever that phobia or that fear or something that gives you a huge amount of anxiety is, rather than expose you to it, and there's, I'm not a psychologist, James, but there is a, a process called exposure therapy. And so if someone had a real fear of heights, for example, what they might try and do is they might try and expose you to a small height and then gradually build it up. And over the, the, the next three weeks, six weeks, some time frame, you'd eventually be a bit more comfortable. You probably wouldn't become a mountain climber, but you might be a little bit more comfortable with it. Yeah, because the reverse happens if you remove yourself from those sorts of environments. Like, if, like for me, I generally don't seek out opportunities to go up high and look down on things at yeah, all. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. That's just, that's a self protection mechanism. People who are afraid, afraid of spiders are going to do the same thing. It's yeah. a spider. They move to another house rather than deal with a spider that's on the wall. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the idea of VR is you can actually say, "I want to be exposed to. I want to cure myself of, of whatever that phobia might be." And you've, you've got this safe space because you've just got a VR headset on, but they're so real. If you get exposed to the spider, for example, in a VR headset, it'll still scare you. But you know you're safe. You know that spider's not going to bite you. It's not going to crawl over Might your head. Might take a bit of reminding, though. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's right. Here, yeah. But yeah. The, that's what they're, they're working on at the moment with exposure therapy. Now, it might sound, well, who really cares? Fear of spiders. Don't worry. Let someone else come and spray it with some pesticide or whatever it might be that they want to hit it with. But... With needles now, with COVID-19 vaccines, oh, this course. is a major drama. Yeah. So there are people who have an absolute fear of needles. I mean, I don't love them, but you just turn the other way and, and grimace and they put the needle in and away you go. But there are some people, they can't bring themselves. They know they want the vaccine, but they can't bring themselves. Yeah, I've got a mate who's six foot two and he's my age and uh, yeah, hates needles. Yeah, right. Hates there them. you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one of the things they're really working on with VR headsets now is getting people some exposure to needles, which you think, well, hold on, you can't really expose yourself via VR to having a needle stuck in you, and you're right. But just having the sight of them, seeing them stuck into someone else, for example, just getting familiar with it gets to the stage where people can again not run down the hallway and click their heels, oh, I'm getting a needle today, but they can go, well, I can bring myself to go to the doctor and have that needle and I can I can actually do it rather than just run away from it. Yeah, it's just about rationalisation. It's about yeah. summing up the situation, making more sense of it in your brain than it would naturally yep. and being able to manage the situation better, yeah. Yeah, so... I thought all this time VR headsets were just for playing games and scaring me, but apparently they can actually be used for good as well. People often want to get into heated debate about robots replacing people in the workforce, but there are just some industries out there with not enough staff, and when there's not enough staff, we're filling the space with robotics now. So what I want to talk about right now is in aged care. Getting enough aged care nurses is a real, real issue. But Matthew... 
using robots to brush hair now of, of elderly people. That's coming in. That's a thing now. That's a thing now. And it, it is really interesting. And I don't think the people that created this whole concept were actually thinking of aged care. I, I think, and I haven't got this from the horse's mouth, but I think they were sitting around going, you know what? It'd be really hard to get a robot to be sensitive enough to brush hair without causing tears. And I've got three daughters and I've helped them get ready for a Steadford for many years. The amount of tears that I've produced, we could have filled a lake with, I think. Yeah, right. And yeah, that's from just my the tangles, those little the tangles, lots of stuff. Yeah. And the terrible way, as I'm told by my daughters, the terrible way that I brush hair. Obviously, I have no idea how to brush <laughs> hair. So, so that that all that all experience in knowing how to go about brushing hair and the pressure and how sensitive, sensitive it is. touch. Yeah, that's right. Now, I don't think I've still got it, but these researchers, maybe they had daughters, I'm not sure, they got to the point where they said, let's try and get to a point where we've got a robot that's got enough cameras and enough sensitivity in the actual brush itself to brush hair, remove tangles. And there's a specific technique, I learned it after many years of tears, where you have to start at the bottom and just brush out those little bits until you finally work all the way up. What you want to do is go, oh, there's a knot. I'll just get at the top and rip into it. But I found out very quickly. some muscle. That's, that's right. Wear some grease and some oil and put it in there and we'll just rip through this. But that didn't work apparently. Right. So robots are being taught this from the beginning to say, start at the bottom, work your way up. And then if it's too much pressure on the brush, stop pull out and then go back down a bit lower again. They got to the point where they had a robot that would do this and then I think they said, huh, oh, that's pretty what cool. <laughs> but yeah, what do we do now? Oh, aged care facilities, there you go. And when they did some research, they found that the nursing staff, so very skilled nursing staff, were spending 18 to 40% of their time on personal care needs for their patients or their clients, such as brushing hair. Well, that makes sense. It yeah. does, yeah. yeah. Whereas they probably could use their skills for things that are more important, the things that they've been trained in more so than nursing staff brushing hair. And you can imagine when you've got a son or a daughter coming to visit their mum or dad in a nursing care facility, you want them to look good. They're and Yeah, you want, you want them to know that... Their mum, dad, grandma, grandpa, they've been looked after. That's right. And even though their medical needs might be looked after, if you turned up and the hair was all messed up, you'd think, oh, do they really care about mum or dad in here? So they spend time doing it, whereas the idea in the future will be there'll be a robot. So sit in this chair, Mrs. Smith, and the robot will comb your hair. It'll look beautiful. When your daughter turns up, they'll say, wow, what a wonderful facility. There's got to be a degree of head massage in there as well, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, I reckon we'll have them lining so. up. <laughs> we keep talking about it. You know, the Jetsons is a perfect example of all these things we've got now. But, of course, Bessie from the Jetsons uh, could do a lot, a range of things. I don't remember Bessie ever brushing hair in the cartoon, but I'm sure she did somewhere there. Yeah. All right, now here's another one to make the punters happy. Um, and we'll op- open the phone lines right now. Um, more trouble with NBN maintenance and insta- installation as all over Australia workers have walked off the job. What's happened now? It's taken them some time, actually. I'm surprised it's taken them this long because the whole model seems a bit broken. And even though we think that everywhere should have their ambient installation already completed now, there are still some new installations, but it's more repairs. Mice. We've got mice running everywhere at the moment, yeah. and mice love chewing through lots of cables, including NBN cables. So workers are having to come out and repair installations. But the whole problem, and this is where the workers are talking about it, the whole problem comes from the fact that these employees out in your house, in your business, doing the MBN installations are not employed by the MBN. They're not even remotely employed by the MBN. There's a parent company will have a, a, a contract with NBN to go and do installations. And then they'll find another company to subcontract to, who'll find another company to subcontract to, and it sometimes goes four levels down to the person you're you're seeing in your home is four levels removed from MBN, which doesn't seem like a sensible environment. And they've got as much love for the MBN as... uh, (laughs) That's right. I think every company along the way takes their bit of cut, if you like, out of the process as well. So the poor guy at the end of the line probably doesn't get paid that much, probably has very little influence in the MBN, but he's the one, or he or she is the one, at the coalface dealing with the customers. And they are the representative. Yeah, that's right. And, and I've seen MBN workers sleeping in their cars, outside oh, jobs, geez. trying to fit as many jobs as possible in while they're away from their home rather than paying for motel bills and all sorts of things. So they finally said, you know what, this is enough. We're, we're going to walk out on the job. And so as a consequence, people that have got MBN repairs, you might have waited three or four days, maybe a week. You're waiting six weeks, eight weeks now for an MBN repair. Installations, a couple of months as well. So you can be waiting a long period of time 
until they get this sorted out. Now, it's a, it's a problem, and, and I don't want to get politically to see how it would be sorted out. If they scrap the whole contracting model, you can imagine all those subcontracting companies that are each level that goes down would all want a payout because you're breaching the yeah. contract that you had. So it's complicated, but I, I actually support the NBN workers here. I think it would be better if from the very beginning they were just employed by the NBN. Cut out some middlemen. Yeah, middlemen, yeah. plural is right, James, yeah. middlemen. Checking your security cameras on your phone is a modern convenience that can bring back real peace of mind when you're away from home or away from the office. But don't get comfortable here, folks. In this next story, Matt, you're going to turn all that upside down with a glitch that occurred with one particular piece of software, right? Yeah. It's something that many people ask me about. They talk about security cameras. I'm a big fan of security cameras. It's a great idea. I've got great stories to tell about catching one of our daughters sneaking out in the middle of the night with security cameras around our house. I tell you, I hit a doorbell once and um, it got no answer. But when I was walking away, I heard a voice calling out to me. And they, they could see me. They could, yeah, and so they were like, yeah. come back, you know. Yeah, so we had this conversation. It was bizarre. Yep. But, you know, welcome to 2021. That's right. But the funny part is that people say, oh, I don't like the idea because someone else could be spying on me. And I give people with total confidence assurances that – the number one thing that keeps the company that sold them that security camera, the CEO from that company, keeps him up at night, is security. Making sure that the cameras are secure and only the person who's meant to see that camera can see them. So it's all okay until this story. And now That's their job, <laughs> is to make sure that you're feeling comfortable. That's right. And it's all been thrown out now because one company, someone noticed it. They went on their phone to check the camera on their house and they noticed they could see a camera on another house and then they kept looking and they could see ones from all around the world <laughs> and they put two and two together oh, and said, no. if I can see everyone else's camera, that probably means they can see my cameras as well. And they were right. There was actually a server glitch in the software from this company that for some unknown reason, it wasn't any cyber attack, it was some error in programming where every camera was viewable by every single person that oh, had an account a with this company. That's worms right there. But I remember seeing a story where there were um, sort of kitty cams, uh, so cameras that were planted within a nursery, mm. um, and people were intercepting that with a speaker attached to the the, the camera yeah. and talking to the kids. And I saw, I remember seeing that on uh, on an ad- advertisement somewhere, um, you know, advertising one of these um, uh, current affair type shows. Yeah, um, yeah. and uh, I thought, oh, that's alarming. But this... And, and the difference to there, everyone. Well, that's right. The difference with those ones, and, I, and I've actually done a few stories on something similar, but people were targeting. So they would be near enough that they would get in Wi Fi range with that yeah, person and then right. targeting those cameras. So that was bad, and still the security wasn't strong enough. But at the same time, you had to be targeted for that. Yeah. This one was just, hello. Open slather. Every camera across this entire network. And I actually, when I was doing the research for this, I looked on the website of that company and it said that this particular company boasts 300,000 happy families around the world. Yeah. It didn't say how many unhappy how many, families <laughs> around the world. disgruntled. Yeah. Or even gruntled families, yeah. Um. <laughs> and, I, and I don't have any... PSA associated with this one, James. Normally I've got some advice to say, well, look, be careful about this or do your password with that. This one, it's just, well, whoops, that shouldn't have happened. Yeah. Um, We're really sorry Keep about an that. eye on it. And, and sorry, did you say that they fixed the glitch? Or? Yeah, it didn't take them too long. It took them a few hours before they fixed the glitch. But there were a lot of people on a lot of forums talking about it and obviously their reputation, I assume yeah. it was good before this, yeah. their reputation has been damaged in this whole process. Now, I love this next idea. It's a great use of initiative. It's what the the internet was built for. We've got our Uber drivers now and we've got our Airbnbs, but now we're talking about renting just your driveway space. Just your driveway. Bits. What are we going to rent next, James? It's, <laughs> it is a bit scary. No, I, no I, I love it. I think it's fantastic. And, you know, coming from a, well, a reasonally sized uh, country centre, every now and then we have big events. And to get a car park anyway, because we don't we don't necessarily have the stadiums that with with the you know, hundred thousand car spaces or whatever, mm. um, it's about finding yourself a spot in a back street somewhere within walking distance uh, of the venue. Because if we have to walk more than about twenty metres, James, yeah, living in a regional area, a we, we think it? that's yeah, a major we get drama. Really upset. <laughs> that's right. First world problem. It might sound like, but <laughs> this is it, it is interesting because Airbnb. You go back twenty years ago, and you'd say to someone that you're renting out a room in your house via some app on your phone, you'd say you're crazy, and I'd almost say the same with about this renting out your driveway space. So you, you live in I Sydney. Think it's ingenious. It is. It is. You live in Sydney, for example, in a, in a highly populated city, and you go off to work at 
7 o'clock in the morning and your driveway of your house just sits there all day, wasted, wasted, oh, There are with driveways and garages oh. and no car. Oh, oh, being very selfish, aren't they? <laughs> and so the idea here is that let's say you live near a railway station, lots of people come to your railway station, you might drive into the city for work, you can rent out via, a, similar to an Airbnb app, you drive into work, you say from, let's say, 8 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock at night, my driveway is available. It'll cost you X dollars. You're probably paying when you go into the city to park anyway, so you're yeah. probably getting that money back. Yeah. And the government loves the idea because they've said if people do this, it saves us building a major car park, which costs a lot of money, near a railway station or near a hospital. So, yes, please, people, rent out your driveways. We love the idea. Yeah, five or ten bucks for the week, and I reckon you're, you're going to clean up. Well, I, I think you'd collect a bit more than that. Well, Some... yeah, yeah, sorry, potentially. But we're talking about you've got to be comparable to those parking uh, – well, sorry, five or ten per week, maybe five or ten per day. Per day, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I think that and maybe even more, depending on how close you were to whatever facility people wanted. But the other part of it is that in Sydney now you're finding people are breaking apart. They might have a unit and it might have a car park. They're breaking that apart of two separate titles because sometimes the car park's worth almost as much yeah. as the unit. It just seems yeah. crazy. So great idea. Using technology – I, I do have a slight concern if I started renting out my driveway and then I come home at 6 o'clock and the car's still there and then I can't park in my driveway. What are you going to do about that? How do you, am I going to get it towed? Or am I going to go through all that trouble? So a few little things to work out. But I suppose it's all just – we're talking about the exceptions here. In general, people would go, I've got to be born by 6 o'clock, so I'll make sure I'm gone and the person that owns the driveway comes home and away you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah look, um, people living together in harmony – Courtesy of a, of a well, um, well-utilised well resource, I think. So the question with that notice, James, what else can we rent out? Can we rent out yeah. roof spaces while we're uh, at yeah, work? Bit of gar- front garden space for people to sit and have their lunch during the, their work yeah. hour. Maybe. What about kids? I'm, I'm happy to rent my kids out yeah. if someone hasn't got kids and wants to try kids for <laughs> a day or two. Try before you buy. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Here's a story that's going to get fists shaking with rage. Social media companies clearly aren't making enough money already. So they've managed to come, with a, come up with a clever idea to keep their CEOs from being homeless and destitute. And, and look, everyone sheds a tear for, for you know, Mark Zuckerberg et al. Um, uh, on a regular basis because they're worried about his livelihood. Um, we, we've got an example here where social media is about to turn it upside down again. They may try, and I don't know they'll get away with it because our generation, James, we used to pay for things. But the generations below us grew up with the fact that Things were free, and so you talk about yeah, yeah, come the, free and easily. Yeah, the, the social media sites, it's just an expectation. If if we had had social media back when we were teenagers, then you would have had to pay for it. You would have had to go and do your your paper run or your milk run and get enough money to be able to buy access to that social media. But now there's that expectation that everything's free, and, and Twitter has been free from the beginning. And you, you start to wonder how do these companies make money? And there's obviously models where they do make money, but. They're a bit worried about maybe some of the advertising processes, and Apple probably is a part of this, where you're not going to be able to track people as easily as to where they go. So maybe that will cut back their advertising revenue a little bit. So they're looking and exploring the idea of actually charging for a social media site. So, for example, Twitter Blue is the example they've come up with. Now, this isn't anything official from Twitter. This is just some people in the know within Twitter, maybe leaking a bit of information, testing the market maybe. $2.99 per month is the fee that might be charged for Twitter Blue. So you'd still have Twitter, but Twitter Blue would give you some extra features. One feature that I do love, and the former president of the United States definitely needed this feature. It's an undo tweet feature. Uh-huh. I reckon every tweet he put out, he could have put the undo tweet on because it was full of rubbish. That would require the um, the sense to w- want <laughs> realize, to. Yeah. To okay. realise that something you'd put out there was stupid. But you're right. So uh, th- that might be one feature. You might have features with photos, better algorithms, better ways to crop a photo to make it more appealing. There might just be some extra features. And then what they'll be doing is saying to people, look at all these wonderful features. It's only going to cost you $2.99 a month to have those features. And I'm not convinced people will pay for those extra features. They've got to be compelling and they've got to be something that some other competitor doesn't come along and say, we've got a version of Twitter. They'll call it something else. They'll call it Sparrow or whatever else they come up with. And they'll offer those features without charging for it. Because as soon as someone steps over the line or gets their model a bit wrong, there are a lot of other companies out there who want to jump all over that. And Twitter's not actually worth a lot in the whole scheme of things. It's only a $43 billion company. Only, yeah, right. In in terms of social media companies. Almost destitute and homeless. Well, that's right. I mean, (laughs) even after the split between Bill and Melinda Gates, they could both buy individually Twitter one and a half times over. So, you know, 
mean, an individual can just snap up a, a social media company. It's not that big. <laughs> not that big. But it, it sounds like a lot. But in, in, in the whole scheme of things, it's not worth a lot. And so if someone else could come on and create another version of Twitter pretty easily or – they might get away with charging. I don't know the answer to that, but I just I oh, get the gut feel that people won't be won't be prepared to pay unless you've got a killer feature you're going to put in there. Yeah, right. Keep your ears peeled for that one, folks. Lossless streaming. What is it, and should I be excited or frustrated by it? Mm, it depends how much of an audiophile you are, and and I'm not. I hear music and I go, oh, that sounds alright. But other people, a bit the same there, yeah. yeah. Other people go, CDs oh, no. sounded good when they came out, right? To me, yeah, that yeah. sounds good. And and so when the whole concept of MP3 players was being born, one of the things that was really important was being able to take a song and compress it and keep most of the sound quality there. And you, the reason you needed to compress it, two things: one. We didn't have huge storage devices like we have now, so they needed to get the songs that were small enough to fit onto some sort of storage medium. And then the next thing was when we started having the ability to download those songs or even stream those songs, the capability of both our our NBN or our internet-connected devices or our streaming devices, our mobile devices, for example, we needed to have the song again fairly small so we could actually get that delivered from point A to point B. Things have changed a bit. We've got storage capabilities now that are huge absolutely huge you just you shake your head my my current ipad is a two terabyte ipad two terabytes what can i possibly do with that how am i going to fill that up and again streaming now we've got very good 4g services 5g is getting better it's at the point now stream we can store it up so the sky's the limit right the sky's the limit just about and so the old songs a three minute song might have been say six megs of data because it was compressed if you have a lossless streaming service, or if you do something rather than an MP3, for example, you have a file that's a WAV, a .wav file, that's a lossless form of storing that song. So it's not compressed. So you get all the richness, all the quality that right. I can't hear, but, yeah. but people can hear and go, that's yeah, wonderful. Yeah, apparently is there. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so you start to get to the point where you have songs in that format, in a, in a lossless format. Then you go from your 6 megs up to maybe 36 megs, or even if you go high res lossless, you might go as far as 145 megs. So the file becomes huge. So then your device that you store some of your music on, you need more storage, but we've got that. Or if you want to stream it, you need a faster streaming service, and we've got that. So Apple has now said, well, we have got a a little, well, they put out a teaser so far to say that there's something coming, something big, music's about to change forever. Basically, they'll have a lossless streaming service because – Guess what? Other companies are doing lossless streaming services as well. Apple doesn't want to be left behind. So you, you've got companies like Spotify that are really focusing on that. You've got Amazon Music HD. You've got Deezer, Tidal. You've got all these companies that are starting to do lossless streaming. So Apple's got to be there as well. Again, the difference it'll make for me, and, and as it sounds for you as well, probably zero, because when you're listening to a lot of this music, you're in the car, you've got a bit of road noise or the kids chatting in the car, or sometimes I listen to music when I go for a bike ride or a run and I can just hear myself panting. So yeah. that's really not yeah. <laughs> that much of a difference there, but for some people this will be a really big deal. Well, i got to say, um, and I might sound a bit like a techno heathen here, but it's the crackle and hiss of, of needle on vinyl. It's the smell of, of a, a vinyl record as you slip it out of the sleeve there. That's still the classic for me. I still love that. Now you can leave the room now. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the similar line to what we were talking about before, um, tough times at Google. Google's about to drop its free unlimited storage, so they're now going to charge us for storage as well. Um, what's what's all that about, Matt? Yeah, it's, it, it was really good when in 2015 they came out with the unlimited photo service. So you've got a Google account, you can store unlimited photos. Now, unlimited is a big word. You don't say yeah. you can store a lot, you can store terabytes, you can store unlimited. That, that Yeah, the, the definition, I think, is infinity. <laughs> well, right? if you're being technical about it, that's right, and, and infinity is big. So you can store that, but then Google said, you know what, this isn't sustainable. And a bit like the Twitter concept, I mean, Google's a bit bigger. It's a $1.6 trillion company, and they've said, you know what, we can't afford this anymore. We can't afford to give away all that storage space, so we're going to start charging for it. And I suppose the, the point of this one is really, what do you do now? It's, it sounds fair enough, uh, but I still like the idea of having free storage. <laughs> <laughs> C- 
can we go back that way? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're younger than your show, James. You, you want that for everything. So there's a whole range of different options for people out there. I mean, Google Photos, they are going to start charging you, and you get a little bit for free, about 15 gigs you get for free, which is still a fair bit. Yeah. But videos now, people are taking 4K videos on their phones, and they chew up a fair bit of space as well. So you, you start to look at that, but there's a, a whole bunch of options as well. So you've got your, your Google Photos. You can start to pay for them. Amazon Photos, they've got some free storage as well, but again, a limit on that, and then you can start to pay per terabyte, per gigabyte, or whatever it might be. Microsoft OneDrive, Flickr Pro, all of these different companies have got options available there for you to store, but all of them are charging. They've all got limits on them, which does sound kind of reasonable. It might also mean that you look at your processes. Do I just keep every photo and every video? Or do I actually look at them after I've taken those 100 photos of the one scene and pick the best one? <laughs> we, we That's the thing. We seem to take a lot more photos this time. We do. Yeah. Uh, well, these days, I should say. Um, and whether or not that means better quality or, uh, you know, what do we do with those? At least I remember flicking through photo albums um, in the past. Yeah. I don't flick through any photo yeah. albums anymore. I don't even right. check my phone. Well, my mum used so. to be very harsh. I mean, with the old cameras with film back in those days, if I'd dare to take two photos of the one thing, mum would have a harsh word to me <laughs> in only the way a mother can and say that I was wasting a print. <laughs> and so you, because when you get them developed, it was the 24 or the 36 yeah. on the there roll. There was an excitement about that. Now it's just, you just hit the button. That's and right. It was a good, button. Oh, no, we'll get another one. We'll get six or seven of those. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And even when you hand, if, you, if you're getting a photo somewhere and you hand the photo to someone, I don't like the, the 50 photos because I've got to try and pick one then. Yeah. And you hand the, the camera to someone or the phone to someone and say, please take a few. And you get it back and they've taken 50. Oh, I just wanted one. Yeah. Just could you just wait till I smile and take one? But no, but the people get used to that. So it, there's all those options. The other option, of course, you've got uh, iCloud as well, only available with Apple phones. It'll only do Apple phones. But they're a little bit different. People get confused by that sometimes because they think, oh, my phone's full. I'll just upgrade or increase my iCloud storage solution. But iCloud doesn't take them off your device and put them in the cloud. It replicates what's on your phone. You can store them in lower quality on your phone, which gives you a bit more room back, but people often get confused by that. I often hear people say, I've run out of space. space. Yeah, mm. I'll just put them in the cloud. But no, it only, it only is backing up what's on your phone. It doesn't take it off there. Right. It's still not the end of the world, James, to actually store them in your home. It's still a bit old-fashioned, I know, rather than putting everything in the cloud, but you can still buy mm. an incredible amount of storage, a one-off cost for that, and stick it on your computer at your home yeah. and actually just back it up there. If you're going to do that, I would say have two of whatever device you have. So stick one in one part of the house and the other one in the other part of the house in case the house burns down or you get broken into whatever. Yeah, I'd be we, a bit paranoid if I was doing that. We tend to do a backup or a save and you save onto one, but we're really encouraging to you to, um, to have two or three different options, aren't we? Yeah, and even ha- have a friend if you want to have a friend. Have a friend that might be somewhere else and just you can create a, a link between two houses and just actually have data what's on the other end, storing back on your end. I mean, there's a whole range of things you can do. But when you do all that, you go, you know what? Maybe I just pay the 20 bucks a month they're asking for (laughs) and then just store it in the cloud. (laughs) Take the shortest route. Fossil fuels, the writing's on the wall for you. Petrol stations are going to start looking different and it's not just about getting charging stations in. Most of their money isn't actually in the petrol sales these days anyway. Am I right? You are right. And I apologise, James. I tried so hard this week. I, I always show an EV story in there. I don't mean to. I said it last week. I love it, Matt. I, I'm not going to lie to you. I love these EV stories. But anyway. Well, this is the closest I could come to not having an EV story. It's not an EV story. It's a petrol station story, kind of. Yeah, no, no, you get away with it on a technicality. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. So the Boston Consulting Group, and I've got a lot of time for them. I, I often quote the BCG with, with the various studies they do. And they did a, a study on petrol stations. And they said if they don't change their business model, By the year 2035, and that's not a long way away, 25%, bare minimum of 25% of petrol stations will be unviable, but maybe up to 80% of petrol stations will be unviable just because the world's changing. Now, they've also said in this same report that by the year 2030, so we're talking nine years, their estimation is that half the cars across the world will be EV sales. So if you owned a petrol station, you'd be saying, well, hold on, if I'm going to reduce my market quite dramatically, well, what am I going to do with that? So the whole report was about the face of the petrol station. Now, it might seem pretty easy just to say, well, that's easy. You just pull out the bowsers, stick in some electric charging stations, and your problem's solved. But I don't think it's quite as simple as that. The the real issue... Never that simple. No, never that simple. The real issue here, I think, is the fact that you've got 
incredibly valuable pieces of real estate. Petrol stations, where are they? They're on busy highways, busy corners, yeah, high-profile locations, and they have been reducing over the years. I did some research in Australia. Back in the 70s, early 70s, you had about 25,000 petrol stations across the nation. We're already down to 6,500 petrol stations. Now, I think most of that has been in larger petrol stations, and rather than you used to have places that just had one Bowser or two Bowsers. They seem to have more Bowsers now. But you're spot on in what you said in the intro. Petrol stations don't make money out of petrol. The petrol is what gets you in the door. They make money out of chocolate, out of soft drinks, out of all the things that they have in the petrol station. Blows me away, yeah. And I think about the car trips that we do. Yep. Uh, we're stopping somewhere and we're grabbing a couple of snacks on, on our way as well. Well, you're just and doing the right thing, James. And we're not the dirt cheap price for these No, snacks, no. Right? <laughs> but you're uh, doing the right thing by those petrol station operators. You're just supporting an industry. Well done. Industry alive. You could there duck you around the, the corner to a supermarket <laughs> and pay half the price for those lollies, but you're doing the right thing by the, super, the petrol station industry. Yeah, so right. what are they going to do? Uh, there is one solution there that says just put some, some charging stations in there. But then you'd want to change the model for that petrol station because you're going to have people captured for longer. So you might have, for example, a restaurant that served better quality food rather than quick grab because it's maybe three minutes to fill up and then grab a, a, a sausage roll or a meat pie. Now they might be there for 15 minutes. So you've got time to serve a bit better quality food well, or a bit better quality sense, coffee. Yeah. But there might be a whole range of other things because of that beautiful location they've got, you might find that you've got people who have got, for example, a car wash. So you build a car wash in, you might charge up at the car wash and then go in and have something to eat. Or maybe there'll be a gym as part of it there. You, you go and charge up for your, for your 15 or 20 minutes and do a workout while you're there. There could be post offices there. There, there could be a whole range of things. And I just, I, I'll be interested to see what they look like in, say, 15 years' time because I don't think we'll just replace the Bowsers with an EV charging station. I think there'll be something completely different or a different model that sits there, again, taking advantage of that real estate. Yeah, so we're looking at a complete revolutionisation of, of the, that, that that entire industry. Oh, I think um, so. Yeah, and so opening up jobs, um, you know, people who are concerned about um, you know, the EVs t- actually removing people from the workforce or whatever, cutting people out of jobs, there's going to be new industries created um, simply just by a changing landscape there. Always. There are always new industries created. And and when you think about the top five petrol station brands in Australia, Coles is number one. Woolworths was number two, but there was a sale, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, there are two petrol station operators, three and four, and then 7-Eleven is number five. So of the top five operators of petrol stations, petrol stations, mind you, yeah. three of them are associated with food brands. So obviously at some point someone in an executive boardroom said, hey, This is a changing face. Petrol stations are no longer places to sell petrol. They're places to sell food in the first example or other things. But the the, the number two Woolworths was just sold fairly recently to a group out of Britain actually called the EG Group. They sold 540 petrol stations for three, for $1.73 billion. So it valued each one about $3.2 million. Now, if the whole place was going to collapse, you wouldn't think someone would pay $3.2 million for each of those. Yeah. They obviously see there is still a business model there going forward. And I'm sure they didn't do it in a short-term way and go, we'll sell a petrol for a few years and then we'll just close them down. I'm sure they've got a plan. You don't normally hand over $1.73 billion without having some sort of a – well, I don't anyway, James. I, I'm a bit more careful with my <laughs> $1.73 billion than that. So I think there's a, there is really a changing face here and I'll be interested to see what it looks like. I think we're all excited by it. Yeah. The winds of change are blowing folks. Well that's it for another week. Thank you very much for tuning in. I've been talking with Matthew Dickerson and I'm James Eddy. Thanks a lot Matt. Thanks James. Have a great week folks.